right, y'all. You're seeing, folks. What are we doing? Stand up, fight back. Shutting down. Stand up, fight back. An entryway. Stand up, fight back. Resisting Trump and What do we do? Stand up, fight back. What do we do? Stand up, fight back. What do we do? Stand up, fight back. As you can see, Trump people are getting very, very aggressive. Pushing our people down. This white guy comes through and starts stepping on black women. Trump openly anchored racism as his lynchman and he won. What a great honor to be able to introduce for the first time ever anywhere the 45th president of the United States of America. <laughs> oh. Why, why, why? The time for empty talk is over. Now arrives the hour of action. We ready! We got it! We got it now! Black people are the We ready! We just, we're gonna have a long road ahead of us. A long four years. Uh, police, I just heard a shot right behind my house. You just heard one shot go off? Hey, it was either that or a rock at the, at the window or something. I don't know. The guy's yelling help, and I'm not going outside. Okay, okay and you can hear somebody yelling for help? Um, I'm pretty sure the guy's dead out here. Holy shit. It was a day when one bullet changed everything. Trayvon Martin, a 17-year-old armed with nothing more than Skittles and an iced tea, was fatally shot by George Zimmerman, a neighborhood watch volunteer who told police the teenager looked suspicious. We, the jury, find George Zimmerman not guilty. Zimmerman's acquittal the following year sent a powerful message to many in black America. Your life doesn't matter. When they said acquitted, acquitted of all charges, I just, my heart sank. And I took probably about 30 seconds and I just started like wailing. Patrice Cullors, an artist and activist in LA, watched the outrage explode online. What she didn't know was she was about to turn this moment into a movement. I started venting online and looking at other people's messages. I just wanted to see what other people were saying and feeling. And my good friend Alicia Garza, she wrote an, uh, a response. and Because so many black people were saying, well, they're pretty much blaming Trayvon. Right. And she said, you know, come on. Like, I will, I, will, I will always fight for us. You know, we don't deserve this. And she closed it off with Black Lives Matter. And I saw it and I put a hashtag on it. And within 24 hours, we created Black Lives Matter. We hope that it will be bigger than we can ever imagine. What began as an affirmation soon became a social media sensation. Since that day, the hashtag Black Lives Matter has been used more than 12 million times. I remember when I first heard Black Lives Matter, it made me uncomfortable, actually. Meanwhile, back in Toronto, a budding young activist named Jenea Khan looked at the three words and wondered if there was any substance to the slogan. I always thought the movement that I would be a part of would, you know, the title, you know, I grew up reading all about the Black Panther Party. I wanted something that had more teeth, you know, um, something that was far, like it was toothier, you know, that felt stronger. And I, you know, being the dramatic person that I am, I spray painted Black Lives Matter on my bedroom wall and I just stared at it. I'm like, what is my issue with this really? Um, and it made me uncomfortable because it was uh, something that I have this, it was a, this type of declaration that had some vulnerability to it. Um, that it was, it was as fundamental as it could get, right? That, our, that black lives have inherent value and worth. Just a simple statement. One that we should be able to say of anyone, of any living thing, um, that your life has worth, that you matter. Um, and so now I'm grateful for it. A year later, Black Lives Matter was still just a hashtag, a virtual movement seeking direction. Then came Ferguson, Missouri, and the death of another unarmed teenager. 18-year-old Mike Brown was fatally shot by a police officer in the St. Louis suburb. 
his corpse left on the hot August pavement for four hours while police investigated. Some say Brown's last words to the officer were, hands up, don't shoot. So Ferguson stood up for the teen who was shot down. Hundreds of activists from across the U.S. calling themselves Freedom Riders were bussed into Ferguson to demand police accountability. The protest was the first national platform for Black Lives Matter. Peace. No justice, no, no peace. peace. No justice, no, no peace. peace. And standing front and center was Patrice Cullors. Ferguson, y'all are winning. Every protest, every march, Every tweet, every live stream you send out, we slowly chip away at the tired, old, racist system. Keep rising, y'all. When Mike Brown was murdered, it was really the pinnacle. It was the setting off point for that community, and uh, they took their grief in public. That community uh, stood up for themselves, and then the rest of us said, we stand with you. Up until that point, we had pretty much lived in post-racial Ob Obama. We have a black president, racism is over, don't worry guys, we got okay. this. And the rest of us were like, mm-mm, it's not true. Don't shoot. Hands up. Don't shoot. Hands up. Don't shoot. The strategy was to disrupt the comfort of complacency. Hands up. Don't shoot. And disrupt they did. We're not done. This is just the beginning. Y'all haven't seen nothing yet. We are Mike Brown! We are Mike Brown! We are Mike Brown! When a grand jury decided not to indict the officer who shot Brown, the anger escalated. Patrice Cullors led protesters off the streets and into a busy Walmart on Black Friday, no less. But what was a relatively polite protest was getting uglier. This footage comes from a witness who stood in the middle of a simmering riot. Dude, dude. Stop trying to turn over the police vehicle immediately. The protesters and the police God damn. provoking each other as the tensions continue to rise. This wouldn't end well. However, the resilience of the revolt was having an effect. Legislators watched the images, then took action. The U.S. Department of Justice launched two investigations, one into Brown's death, the other into the Ferguson Police Department. And we only got two African-American cops. Don't that tell you something? Don't that explain something to you? Still, Patrice Cullors knew the hard work had just begun. And then the last thing was for us to go back home, go back home and do the work. And so you would see the development of the network, the Black Lives Matter network after this. Darnell Moore was in Ferguson. He writes for Mike, an online news source for millennials which boasts 30 million readers a month. He says in just a matter of weeks, Black Lives Matter had come of age. More than 100 days, young people were on the streets amid tear gas, amid rubber bullets being sprayed. And these are folk who did not wake up looking to be organizers and activists. And they amplified those three words. Black Lives Matter on their shirts or on their signs, um, outside every day, and it really they brought, they, they, they animated, uh, they brought life to, to this mantra, and it, it was the reason why so many people began to see it as a movement cry around the world. No justice, no peace! No justice, no peace! No justice, no peace! Ferguson's battle cry was heard in Toronto, where the campaign against police brutality found a ready audience. And stoking the fires of dissent was Jenea Khan. We had a call out within 24 hours. Uh, you know, the numbers on our Facebook event skyrocketed, but we're, we didn't take that you know, seriously. We took it with a grain of salt. We're like, let's see what happens. It's freezing outside. And over 3,000 people showed up. 
there was fervor, there was energy, um, there was people wanting to commit and plug into something. The unlawful slaughter of black bodies by the hands of power has continued day after day, year after year, century after century, life by precious life. From the fires of Ferguson to the streets of Toronto, Black Lives Matter T.O. was born. In Toronto, there wasn't a place for somebody like me. Uh, a few years you know, before then, um, somebody who was trying to politically evolve, um, who had you know, gotten a degree and, and didn't necessarily know what to do with it. Um, somebody who was too easily cast aside as a black militant, and now there is all this space for black radicalism. And for Khan, the fight was on. As a boxer, Khan had learned discipline, resilience, and courage. Living by the fighter's philosophy, how much can you really know about yourself if you've never been in a fight? You know, the first rule of boxing is protect yourself at all times. And I believe that to be true of organizing as well. And in order to be protected, one must know what it is that we go, each of us go through. The second rule of boxing is the punches don't hurt less, you just learn how to deal with them better. And uh, just because I'm well versed in how to articulate my oppression, that doesn't mean instances of racism don't hurt as much. I think the last rule of boxing is maybe one of the most important for organizing, which is the only punch that hurts is the one you don't see coming. Boxing is a science of adjustments, and I would say the same for organizing. Hiss, hiss, hiss. The fight would quickly escalate, with Black Lives Matter leading the charge. We made the decision that we are not going to allow mainstream media, aka white media, in the space to tell our story. There's always more to our stories. You can stay connected with The Fifth Estate on Facebook. Get the latest on upcoming shows and special video features. As tensions mounted between police and black America, Jenea Khan emerged as the international ambassador for Black Lives Matter, traveling back and forth between Canada and the US on a mission to debate, disrupt, and dismantle the status quo. Khan grew up all over Toronto, moving 22 times from public housing to homeless shelters to group homes. Khan's mother struggled with mental illness, marginalizing a family that never felt the warm embrace of multiculturalism. Our circumstances were not, not so good, okay? Mm -hmm. But it affects the children because, you know, the children are saying that they're fatherless, that they're, they're this and that, and it's disenfranchised, that they're marginalized. Food was always an issue, uh, money was always an issue to a degree, but I think as a child you're sort of sheltered from that. Um, but as you start to see um, both of your parents sort of um, feel the weight day in and day out of, of uh, having to care for children with nothing, um, you know, we saw them uh, look to different coping mechanisms. I had no money, Jenea. Mm -hmm. Right, I had that check and the baby bonus. Mm -hmm. Right, and what your dad gave me when he could. Well, I want to be clear. I was embarrassed, you know mm -hmm. why? Because my mother was on the phone always saying, you should be sending those kids to the university. Mm -hmm. Like, and I, even though that was very negative, it was like, where, where am I gonna get the money to do this? Every day I'm like, oh my goodness. Khan knew school was the key to overcoming poverty, but it was also where Khan would be introduced to police harassment. I went through the school system here my entire life. You know, I have uh, been criminalized by the police as a young person simply existing in my school, um, and that really streamlined me um, into multiple interactions with the police. Khan will forever remember not only being a target of anti-black racism, but watching others stay silent. I got onto the 63 Ossington, uh, and there was uh, a white man sitting at the very front of the bus, and something about me really offended him. And so I walked to the back and near the back doors where I always stand. And for about three stops, he just yelled. 
he just yelled. He called me a nigger, and he was just yelling at me. And I just stared at him. And I looked at everyone else on the bus, and not one person looked at me or this individual. And to this day, I still wonder what I could have done, what I should have done. And that was a really difficult learning moment to me because the reality is with racism, we're talking about power. That's, that's what racism is. And so restoring balance to a situation isn't always possible. And that's a very difficult thing to, to come to terms with. The first chapter of Black Lives Matter was founded here in Los Angeles. It's a city of disparities, a playground for the rich, a dumping ground for the poor. Here, amid the tent cities, are the people Patrice Cullors is fighting for. Oh, uh, tell, me, tell me what you want me to do, Walter. What should I Sorry? What, what, should I, what color is each thing? This is the outline of uh, Los Angeles, so we're just going to do it in black. Okay. It's a short trip in many ways from the tent cities to LA's Twin Towers Jail. LA County operates the largest prison system in the U.S. Color's dad was incarcerated here, so was her mentally ill brother. He was 19 years old. Uh, he was in the middle of um, a manic episode when he was um, punched and kicked by multiple sheriffs. Uh, they beat him so badly he blacked out. And when he awoke, he was in a pool of his own blood. I was 16 years old, but my mother was calling, asking for her son, and they never responded. When she finally was able to see my brother, he was emaciated. Having, having this, this jail being part of your youth, mm -hmm. how did that affect you now as an adult? Something changes in your body and your spirit. And for me, I knew that there had to be more than this. My family members deserved more, that I deserved more. And um, I didn't know what it would take. I didn't know that I would become an organizer, but I, I felt it in my spirit that um, there was something, there was some bigger work that needed to be done. Part of that work was ensuring there was a witness whenever a black person died in the hands of police. When Eric Garner was choked to death during an arrest and New York police were acquitted, crowdsourced images amplified the community's anger. After an investigation was made public into the shooting death of Izell Ford by LA police, protesters live streamed the fury. And when Freddie Gray died after his spine was essentially severed in the back of a Baltimore police van, the community's unfiltered outrage spilled over onto social media. Paddy Wagon don't kill you. And everybody know that. So it's more to that story. And we all know that. So we're going to find out, and if we don't find out, these young black brothers out here, it's going to get real. With every death, Black Lives Matter was convinced the mainstream media would always suggest the black victim was somehow to blame, not the police. So during some protests, reporters seen as unsympathetic to the movement were kept out. We made the decision that we are not going to allow mainstream media, aka white media, in the space to tell our story. When they put us on the news and when they put us in on the TV and put us out there, they put us out there as thugs, criminals. To author and activist Darnell Moore, the movement had now adopted a provocative stance. Are you part of the solution or part of the problem? Chaining oneself to, to a police headquarter, um, you know, stopping uh, an, an event from happening are the things that um, make people very uncomfortable. Those tactics are what would be what one might describe as militant, I mean, but then there are also folk who feel as, as, as the need to sort of arm oneself is also a tactic. Um, and that's different than reformist strategies like attending meetings and going to city council meetings and arguing for regulations and laws to be changed. Two years after a hashtag was born, hundreds of people gathered for Black Lives Matter's first national convention. There are now 40 chapters across the U.S. and two in Canada. And what makes this movement different? It's led almost entirely by women, many lesbian, transgender, or queer, like Patrice Cullors. After Ferguson, 
after Los Angeles, after Baltimore, after Florida, after Detroit. How are we going to save black lives? In a time when it feels like white racists and law enforcement are at war with black people and black bodies, when black, when black folks feel like we are rising up, how are we going to save black lives? And it was here in Detroit where colors met Jenea Khan. I didn't come into the movement saying like, you know what I really want to do? I really want to get married and move to another country. That was definitely not something I was looking to do. There was just an instant connection between us. Um, and I think when you're in these really trying moments, um, relationships are necessary, first of all. Uh, it's nice to be able to go back home when we're, we're actually at home uh, to someone who knows exactly what's happening. I have met Patrice at the right time in our lives um, because the movement is all about possibility. Um, it opens you up for it. The movement forces you to open up, um, to build connections with people, to trust, um, to challenge, to grow, to advocate. Um, and it roots you in something that is more meaningful than just your own sense of self. You don't think I should say that? Not like that. What's wrong with the way that I said it? It's mean. They're now the first couple of Black Lives Matter, traveling constantly to organize new chapters, mobilize new activists, knowing so many cities in the U.S. are just one bullet away from another Ferguson. This isn't back to L.A. No, this is from um, LAX to, to D.C. But Black Lives Matter would soon face an angry backlash. November 2015, a Minneapolis police officer killed Jamar Clark with a single bullet to the head. Black Lives Matter organized a high-profile three-week protest outside a police precinct. We are demanding justice. We are demanding it now. We want the names of the officers. We want to know, have them fired immediately. And we want to prosecute it right now. Enough is enough. They have to understand that in the city of Minneapolis, we mean business. We're tired of there being a tale of two cities. The best of times if, if, if you're white, and the worst of times if you're black. Black 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 the protest was deeply polarizing, testing the city's fragile race relations. Tensions boiled over when 24-year-old Alan Scarcella shot and wounded five black protesters in what prosecutors called a racially motivated attack. He was convicted of assault. It was clear the movement itself was now a target. This is a movement that centralizes those who are most marginalized, that puts them at the forefront to lead because there is nobody more equipped. But Black Lives Matter wouldn't back down. Protesters occupied Minneapolis City Hall, and Jenea Khan, the Canadian who felt silenced by racism, was now a powerful voice in the growing movement for change. And I want you to look at these black people here, look at them behind me, these ones who have been the leaders of your movement. I need y'all to understand something. The implications mm. of the work that we do will follow us for the rest of our lives. Yeah. Right. Some 50 years after the birth of the Black Panther Party, the original disruptors weigh in on the fight for black power. And then here comes the Panthers. Uh, embodying that coolness and that badness and that swagger and not standing up to the bullies on the corner but the bullies of the world our goal was we want to change the world that was what we wanted we didn't think small we want to change the whole world today's mantra may well be black lives matter 
But back in the 60s-era America, a decade of civil unrest, images like these suggested black lives didn't matter. The police made that clear. And despite America's founding promise, segregation and white supremacy revealed all men and women were not created equal. We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. Martin Luther King used his moral strength as a bulwark against anti-black racism. But after his assassination in 1968, black America could no longer turn the other cheek. After Dr. King was killed, and a lot of us said they killed the Prince of Peace, so yeah, it's time for, for black power. So that's what, that's what pushed me to join uh, the Black Panther Party. The Panthers were radical, revolutionary, armed, and dangerous. They were the original disruptors. Jamal Joseph joined the party when he was just 15, growing up in the Bronx. More than once, I got smacked around by cops for, you know, simply being at the wrong place at the wrong time or being with the wrong kids. And then here comes the Panthers, uh, embodying that coolness and that badness and that swagger and not standing up to the bullies on the corner, but the bullies of the world. Police were killing people. And they were doing it everywhere. They were doing it with impunity. Kathleen Cleaver was the party's communications secretary and married to leader Eldridge Cleaver. The Panthers' pistol-powered message to police, stop murdering black people. Every killing was justifiable homicide. So after a point, you know, people's sons, people's brothers, their husbands, all kinds of men were being, young men, young black men were being killed. So it's not justifiable homicide, and so it built up a tremendous um, desire on the part of young black men and women to do something about this. The Panthers' rapid rise was similar in some ways to Black Lives Matter. The party was built to be a watchdog, making waves and making headlines, empowering everyday black Americans to demand change. While the Panthers preached militancy, they also ran social programs, including free breakfasts for inner city kids, serving up to 20,000 meals a week. Maybe uh, a kid in first grade or kindergarten uh, that's trying to sit still and listen to a teacher explain that three apples plus two apples equal five apples, and his stomach is growling, maybe that's the problem. Why don't we start with a hot, nutritious breakfast? But revolutions are impatient. The Panthers would begin to get even more radicalized after the party was infiltrated by FBI agents and party leaders were either jailed or killed by police. That would lead to destructive infighting. The Panthers would eventually implode. You were, in the time, branded a terrorist organization. Oh, absolutely. A criminal organization, a terrorist organization. Um, and to that we would respond with Malcolm X's quote is that the oppressor has always been masterful at making the criminal look like the victim and the victim look like the criminal. Today, Kathleen Cleaver is a law professor and a grandmother. She says movements like Black Lives Matter need at least one key ingredient to survive, courage. We didn't think small. We want to change the whole world. Now maybe we got to change a few towns. Was that good enough? No, no. The, 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 the struggle continues. La lucha continua. We expect another generation to pick up where we left off. The reality for black life today is whether you fight or not, you die anyway. That is the reality for many of us. And it was a reality that we are fighting to change. And if the reality is to uh, fight or die, I'll choose to fight. Nobody in this movement is setting out to be a martyr. Nobody. Black Lives Matter has carried on that message of black power, and Jenea Khan brought it into the thick of things in Toronto. But also, what happened here? The group camped outside Toronto Police Headquarters for 15 days. Protesters demanded details be made public surrounding the police shooting death of Andrew Loku. Everybody deserves somebody to fight for them, to advocate for them, should some injustice happen. That's all we're doing. 
The Special Investigations Unit, which examines police shootings, had cleared the unnamed officer of any wrongdoing. But Black Lives Matter kept rattling the city's cage. The whole world is watching! The whole world is watching! Here is the SIU report that could be read in mere minutes. We decided to print it up so that we can make it accessible to Mayor John Tory. When Toronto Mayor John Tory dodged a public meeting with Black Lives Matter, Khan the Disruptor crashed a city council meeting. Perhaps you will have a comment on the death of Andrew Loku. Please don't touch me. They, there should be spectacle in what we do because that's what politics are. They're spectacle. But oftentimes when it is racialized people or black people taking up space and facilitating that ourselves, there's an incredible amount of pushback. We're ready for pushback. Pushback is good. Pushback is better um, because it, there's, there's conversation and dialogue and tension. I'm Kathleen, and you're? I'm Janae. 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 Then came this, an extraordinary moment when Ontario Premier Kathleen Wynne walked out of the legislature to meet with Khan and other Black Lives Matter protesters. It was a measure of how far the movement had come in Toronto. We are undertaking a review of the SIU. We are reviewing all the police oversight bodies. We need your help in doing that. You are on the front line. You understand these issues. We need your help in those reviews. If not for the pressure that we've applied, these things wouldn't have happened. So our issue is not whether or not you will latently have a response, but really how long this will take. We'd like a timeline. Okay, we're going to need some contact information so that our ministers can make touch with you, okay? But every victory comes at a price. Khan and Sandy Hudson, another co-founder of Black Lives Matter TO, insist they're standing up for the disempowered. And yet their many critics say the group is nothing more than a bunch of bullies. Isn't bully defined by, like, having all this power over somebody else? All this, I don't know, maybe systemic and political power, physical power, maybe, you know, and for you A to call... A militarized power, maybe even? <laughs> oh, right, because it was in defense of the police. Maybe that's kind of ironic that you would call us the bullies. Before Black Lives Matter, in Canada, we weren't talking about anti-black racism in Canada as a reality. It wasn't a conversation topic. Um, and so there's been this myth of this racial haven. And if that myth were true, none of my experiences would be real. Black Lives Matter would make even more enemies last summer at Toronto's Pride Parade. The group was invited to march in the parade as honored guests. It was a defining moment. Michael Brown, say his name! Michael Brown, say his name! If we are being called and named the honorable group for the work that we've done, the only honorable thing that we could do is continue that work. Pride was no exception. We're going to take a moment of silence to start for the life that we lost in Orlando. Please say. People behind us! People behind us! The disruptors brought the parade to a halt, demanding a seat on Pride's organizing committee for marginalized communities, and in reaction they say to police harassment, they wanted all police floats banned. Removal of police floats in the Pride marches and parade. The pres they got what they wanted, and then things got ugly. First people in the crowd turned on them, then the critics and the racists came out in full force on social media. Your racism is showing! Your racism is showing! These are your community members! These are your community members! 20 years ago... There was an incredible amount of pushback. I mean, I got death threats for that. Um, for, for blocking pride? Yes. You got I, death threats? Oh, many. Many um, and people were very generous with their details. You know, they're, you know, they're from. They're all the majority of them were based in Canada. Um, 
you know, the, the content was, you know, hanging and lynching. And but what, what does that suggest to you when, when, when this act of protest can generate death threats? I mean, it, it is exactly why we need to do the work that we're doing. We've heard black lives matter, all lives matter. Well, cops' lives matter too. The critics were emerging south of the border as well. Uh, but this isn't raising awareness. No, no. This is stoking. This is stoking fears. It's stoking hatred. This is a movement that has devolved into fear mongering, hate mongering. And caught in the crosshairs of a law and order president, Black Lives Matter finds itself at a crossroads. Either fight or fold. The summer of 2016 would be a turning point for Black Lives Matter. On one day alone, the network organized protests against police brutality in 18 cities across the U.S., including this one in Dallas. We have to stop the nonsense and take back our community. And we have to police ourselves. And in the event that an officer tries you unjustly, don't wait for him to pull the trigger. Fight like you love yourself. Their demands for police reform were being heard. The one that paid me, paid. And then shots rang out. Is that gunshots? I believe so. A sniper began picking off police officers at the protest. The shooter was Army veteran Micah Johnson. He had no connection to the Black Lives Movement. He was a lone gunman with a grudge. He said he wanted to kill as many white policemen as possible. Five officers were killed, seven others wounded, as well as two civilians. Now Black Lives Matter was under the gun. Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. How Black Lives Matter is killing Americans. That is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. I think the, uh, the reason that there's a, there's a target on police officers' backs is because of groups like Black Lives Matter that make it seem like all police are against blacks. They're not. Uh, but this isn't raising awareness. No, no. This is stoking. This is stoking fears. It's stoking hatred. This is a movement that has devolved into fear mongering, hate mongering. In so many places, had an opportunity to raise some legitimate issues. Instead, we're talking about, you know, killing cops. Black Lives Matter called the incident a tragedy, saying the movement is all about ending violence, not escalating it. But they made it clear they would not be silenced by the shootings. When law enforcement tries to blame us on the killings of um, their officers, it's, it's pretty unfortunate and it's, it's really cheap. Uh, it doesn't allow for a full view of what we're doing. Um, and uh, to be frank, I'm concerned. It's my life a thousand times easier. Remember how you're like, don't worry, I'm gonna clean up my hair. <laughs> what happened to that? I couldn't find you afterwards. <laughs> Back at home in LA, Colors and Khan have a quiet moment in the face of a growing backlash. Their critics on the right have called Black Lives Matter a terrorist group, leaving the couple at the center of the movement, who now have a baby boy, worried for their lives. It'd be dishonest to say that there are moments where I'm, I'm like, let's stop. <laughs> Let's go somewhere else. Let's just raise our baby. But five minutes later, I'm like, all right, we're in this. This is, this is our path. I can't shy away from my path. Movements don't make you famous. It throws you on this platform, but provides none of the protection that often comes with fame. It's something that we struggle with every day, you know, every time that we say bye to each other. Uh, the thought of losing her, um, it's, it kills me. It's devastating. What's our seated posture? Take a look at the posture. You may feel like you're in the electric chair. Doesn't have to look that way. <laughs> Their campaign has thrust these young activists into the blinding glare of the spotlight. So now they're arming themselves with media training the deaths in Dallas still weighing heavily on their minds. People just came at us so hard, and I remember the BBC called me at like four in the morning and demanded a statement from me, and I was like, who 
who are you? And she's like, but don't you feel like you need to defend yourselves? Yeah, I was also deeply paralyzed in that moment. Like, I felt like I couldn't move. Yeah. And I felt like I couldn't move, and I felt like I couldn't breathe because I was nervous about what the internal dynamics would look like no matter what we said. I think the media's investment in scandal uh, and in skepticism um, means that we're always on the defensive. And so my experience has been uh, one where the media has been incredibly hostile. Um, and so oftentimes we're put in a position where we have to disprove what they're saying before we can talk about what it is that we need to say and we need the public to hear. But the movement is now up against a powerful voice in the White House. The black president is gone. The law and order president is now in control. And the Trump White House says it will put an end to what it calls the dangerous anti-police atmosphere by going after any violent disruptors. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. But Patrice Cullors believes what started as a hashtag is now a powerful movement that can't be undone. Black lives that matter here! Yeah. Black lives that matter here! Yeah. It's changed the debate around whether or not we should be talking about black people and if we have value. It really makes you um, take a stand. If you can't say black lives matter, then where do you stand in this conversation? On Trump's inauguration day, the disruptors were there with a new message. We are all under attack. That means that we all have a responsibility to fight with and for each other every day. To women's groups, labor organizations, anti-racism activists, Black Lives Matter says, let's work together. The process of this work, for a lot of people, isn't so much learning as it is unlearning. We need to create space for different ways of understanding people. Um, and for some of those people, it's as, it's as basic and simple as Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter!